Kicking off the list at number 10, the Stellar Sea Cow. Stellar indeed, okay. The Stellar Sea Cow was named after George Wilhelm Stellar, who discovered this massive creature in 1741 during the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition. They found her right after the crew became shipwrecked. What a lovely surprise to an otherwise horrible situation. They were around over 2.6 million years ago and they were no match for humans. They only swam about a meter deep and once humans came into the picture with you know hunting and aggression and everything, they were quite easy to hunt. George Stellar commented that the animals had an uncommon love for their families, which in turn made it even easier for us to hunt them. Considering the one year gestation period, the species just couldn't reproduce fast enough to keep up with our hunting. But this list, we have a little hope now, don't we? Scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we could see the creature again one day, hopefully. The answer may lie right now in the DNA of a dugong. Dugongs are the cow of the sea. You know what, they're great. Let's have all the cows of all seas back immediately. Number nine, passenger pigeons. The passenger pigeon once ruled the skies over Canada as recently as the 19th century. Billions of these bright orange birds would just paint the skies. They would fly in flocks so large, it would block out the sun for a short amount of time. Isn't that beautiful? It's like some Lion King stuff right there. But only a few decades passed and passenger pigeons are now no more. So what happened? Well, the very last passenger pigeon, her name was Martha. She passed away in the Cincinnati Zoo back in 1914. So we took a look at her DNA to see if Martha held any secrets to her extinction. They discovered Martha had a low genetic diversity for such a growing population. Natural selection and hunting obviously just eliminated the coolest looking bird out there by far. A little different than the pigeons we have today, that's for sure. The last one died in 1914, but in 2019, paleontologists found remains of the pigeon protected in indigenous lands in Canada, up in Northwest Territories. They blended passenger pigeon DNA with Archaeopteryx dinosaur DNA. Yeah, we're bringing back pigeons with a hint Oh, dinosaur. What could go wrong? Number eight, the woolly mammoth. It was announced only months ago that a team of scientists and entrepreneurs over at a company called Colossal are planning to bring back, are planning to bring the woolly mammoth back to life. That's just the thing we need right now in this world. Out of all the problems, we're like, you know what could solve it? The woolly mammoth, for sure. That'll bring jobs back. The Siberian tundra thousands of years ago was once full of these woolly mammoths, but climate change began to slow them down just a little bit. And humans also needed food, so that surely didn't help. These guys provided warmth and, well, look at them, obviously, a lot of food. Genetics company Colossal raised over $15 million to try and bring this thing back to life. Honestly, I hope it works, but then, I mean, now what? All these things are great scientifically, but it's like, and then what? Number seven, the dodo bird. Speaking of the devil, this is, we're definitely gonna eat these guys. Dodo birds were once big and beautiful. These flightless ground nesting birds once filled the island of Meritius, located in the Indian Ocean. They had massive talons, they were big gray and blue, and they didn't have any natural predator, which is pretty sweet. They didn't have one until we came along. Around 1507, the island was discovered by Portuguese sailors and, well, the rest is history. They were the easiest bird to hunt, hence the phrase, dead as a dodo. They weren't just loved by sailors either, we're not just 100% here to blame, you know? Monkeys, rats, pigs, any animal that made its way to the island easily had their eggs for lunch. So yeah, it didn't take a long time for the dodo bird population to be completely wiped out. The last dodo was hunted in 1681, but can we bring back the dodo bird? Are we doing it? I think we're gonna do it. Scientists found an extremely well-preserved dodo skeleton back in 2007, so we may have a chance at picking some DNA apart here. A research facility near Melbourne, Australia is currently trying to use pigeon genes to bring this bird back to life. I mean, I'm all for the idea of bringing back an animal. Scientifically, that's a feat in itself, but do we really think nobody's gonna make dodo chicken wings? I'm just saying. That's just a problem waiting to happen. Number six, Pyrenean Ibex. The last Pyrenean Ibex was a female named Celia. A falling tree sadly killed her in 2000. She was a subspecies of the Spanish Ibex and the Pyrenean Ibex were native to the Pyrenees Mountains on the border of Spain and France, as her name hints towards. Back in the medieval ages though, their population was reduced drastically to an endangered level. So it wasn't just recently, it was way back, you know, because of, again, hi, we got hungry. They were all over the place and knights and swords and bows and armies to feed. They were hunted down, sadly. Disease spread by humans also played an important role in their demise during this time. The Pyrenean Ibex was successfully cloned and brought back from extinction for seven minutes. So we actually did this one. DNA from the last living lady was implanted in the womb of a domestic goat. Lung complications are why the clone didn't last, but listen to what I just said. They made a clone. Seven minutes is a start. I think I could handle a clone of myself for seven minutes and then after that I'm tapping out. Number five, Tasmanian Tiger. Once native to Australia, the Tasmanian Tiger, also known as the thylakine, 
It was a massive carnivorous marsupial that went extinct around the 1930s. Major factors here, as you guessed, climate change, hunting, and its genetic diversity wasn't all too great. It was sad on one hand because these beautiful creatures disappeared so recently, but it's recent enough that we have a shot at bringing them back. So we're like, ah, oh, but maybe, maybe. Yeah, imagine looking outside and seeing this thing on your front yard. Are we ready for this? Specimens still remain preserved in jars. Thank God for those jars. By the time we open those things up, right? All those jar guys are like, hmm, finally, pull this one out. Already we have some of the Tasmanian tiger genes present after scientists inserted them into a mouse fetus. The Australian Museum has been working hard to bring this beast back to life. They're only still lacking the DNA to fully recreate it. So if you have any jars of Tasmanian tiger parts, you know, help us out, hit those thumbs. Number four, the great auk. Once thriving in colonies off North Atlantic coasts, the great auk would grow to 30 inches long and its tiny wings would be only used to swim. Had little tiny, little wings. The wings were much smaller, they were about 13 centimeters long, little flappy arms. No wonder they couldn't fly, look at these things, oh my God. They were cute, but obviously they were quite defenseless. Around the 1500s, European fishermen discovered this perfect area for hunting, and it just happened to be where most of these great ox were hanging out. Newfoundland looked like the iceberg from Club Penguin, and then we just rolled in and we're like, ho ho ho, we are so hungry. It was packed, so they rapidly declined, and by 1950, the last two known specimens were hunted by a single fisherman on LD Island just off the coast of Iceland. Scientists plan on using genetic information extracted from their fossils or preserved organs. Remember those jars of organs always coming in handy. They plan on editing their DNA in the closest living species, which is now the razor-billed auk. The organization Revive and Restore is behind the wheel on this one, and I'm hoping they pull through. Number three, the moa. This New Zealand bird went extinct about 600 years ago. Moa were these flightless birds, massive, might I add, and archaeologists first discovered its fossil in a cave. Its flesh and everything was still attached. That's the gross part. These ancient birds would reach about five feet tall, and when you think of dinosaurs, you probably think that's quite petite in comparison. These birds stopped flying right after the dinosaurs went extinct. Interesting timing. According to biologist Matthew Phillips from the Australian National University in Canberra, these birds safely roamed the land after they didn't need to make these daring dino escapes in the sky. They walked around, got fat, and would hang out in caves. Honestly, pretty ideal. Phillips says this is an advantage when it comes to birds and evolution because wings, be it big or small, kill energy. So it might seem a little depressing to watch a creature lose the ability to fly, but it's because they're eating good, they're comfortable now. Scientists have now found more moa DNA from ancient eggshells, so it's possible that we may see these fatties soar the skies once again. Number two, Megatherium aka giant ground sloths. That's a bit of a nicer name. Yeah, sloths, let's bring those back. Wait, they're already here, hmm? I'm confused, Taylor. Sloths used to be a lot bigger than we think. We often look at them now for being so slow and silly. The movie Ice Age or Zootopia, they sure didn't help their case. Now, of course, the giant ground sloth is closely related to our modern three-toed sloth, but luckily for us, today's sloths aren't that big. They're not the same size as an elephant, which is pretty sweet. That would be a horror film. If a giant elephant-sized sloth started to climb that tree, slowly, might I add, ugh, I'd be sick. We may be able to bring this one back, although they died off 8,000 years ago. DNA samples were extracted from their hair remains, so the next step now is to develop a fetus in an artificial womb. That's the hard part. That's where science and technology might just do the rest. But as of right now, we just we've got a pile of hair. We're like, maybe. And finally, number one, the gastric brooding frog. I'm a big fan of frogs and toads, all that stuff. Except for when they hatch eggs out of their back. That's arguably the worst thing I've ever seen in my life. We'll maybe show you after, maybe, I don't know. These gastric brooding frogs would swallow their eggs and then hatch them out of their mouth. So if you watch them give birth in reverse, it would be pretty confusing. That would be a horror film. They went extinct back in 1983, but scientists have figured out how to implant these dead cells into a fresh egg from an entirely different frog species. Let's just hope these new ones aren't born out of your back. Starting off at number 10 now, we have Spinosaurus. Let me start by asking you guys a question. What's the largest carnivorous dinosaur of all time? Surely it's the T-Rex, right? They've always been portrayed as the top dogs. Their name literally translates to Tyrant Lizard King. I was surprised to learn that it's actually the Spinosaurus, perhaps the largest known carnivorous dinosaur of all time. It lived about 100 million years ago. Estimates put the length of these things about 60 feet while weighing as much as 20 23 tons. That's three and a half times as much as the T-Rex. If its sheer size wasn't scary enough, you might have guessed from its name that it also had very big spines. They fanned out across its back and formed what is usually referred to as its sail. What scientists aren't sure about
about is if the spines were covered in fat and looked kind of like a huge camel hump thing, a camel the size of a small building. Spinosaurus is a predator, but one that hunts in water. It's Ichthyophagus, a fish eater. Coming at number nine now, we have the giant crocodile. That's right, if you thought the best way to make a crocodile even more scary was to give it more teeth, you're wrong. You just make them way bigger, and they really did exist. The scientific name for this animal is Sarcosuchus. They lived around 112 million years ago during the early Cretaceous period in what is now Africa and South America. These things weighed about eight tons and grew up to 40 feet in length. It's almost twice as long as the biggest living crocodiles today. The giant crocodile would probably laugh at the crocodiles we have today, then it would eat them, then it would eat us, then it would laugh. Luckily, they died out over 100 million years ago. Next up, number eight now, we have the walking worm. The scientific name for this one is Hallucigenia fortis. It was part of a family of walking worms. They looked like worms, they acted like worms, but they had legs, actual little legs. Get this, scientists discovered their fossils in Canada and China. They were so weirded out by their appearance, they called them hallucigenia, as in hallucinogenic, like hallucinogenic drugs. These things are so weird looking, the scientists basically thought they were tripping out. That's what I'm taking from that story. I'm thinking if normal worms usually creep people out a bit, then a big walking one that looks like it came from a Harry Potter book might be a little bit too much. Moving on to number seven now, we have Androsarcus. Think of a big scary mammal, a lion, a tiger, maybe a bear, oh my. This thing would eat them for breakfast. Androsarcus lived in what is now China about 45 million years ago. The only known skull of this creature was discovered in Mongolia in 1923. It's now on display in the American Museum of History in New York. It was from only this skull and a few bones that scientists were able to make an accurate construction of what this beast would have looked like. When they finished the model, they were pretty shocked to see that it would have weighed about 4,000 pounds. That would possibly make it the largest land-dwelling mammal predator ever. We're talking bigger than all the lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. If you don't want to step into a ring with any of those animals, well, those animals wouldn't want to step into a ring with this thing. Next up at number six now, we have the pig from hell. I'll admit, that's the name I gave it. You'll see why though. This mammal is known as the Entelodon. They lived 37 to 28 million years ago, all across Eurasia. If we were around back then, we probably would have said they looked like pigs, but like really terrifying ones. Despite being on all fours, these things were four and a half feet tall. They were massive. Some scientists say they had a ravaging appetite for meat. These things would eat you, they'd eat me, and if there wasn't any other meat around, they'd end up eating each other. You heard me right. Some people have suggested that entelodonts were actually cannibalistic. They craved meat so much, they'd even eat their own kind. How does that sound to you? Imagine one of these things charging right at you. You wouldn't stand a chance. You better hope they'd eaten their fill for the day or you'd be the filling. Next up number five now, we have the three foot long scorpion. That is the scientific name, just kidding. This is actually Pulmono scorpius. It looks just like modern scorpions. It had the same front claws and sting in its tail. The only difference is this thing was bloody massive. It lived over 300 million years ago during the Carboniferous period and this helps explain why these things grew so massive. Back then the oxygen content in Earth's atmosphere was a lot higher. Scientists know that this is one of the key factors in determining how big some creatures get. So if you don't like creepy crawlies, just be glad there isn't too much oxygen in the air. We know this creature had venom, like many modern scorpions, but it's difficult to know just how toxic it would have been. One thing's for sure though, you wouldn't want to stick around these things to find out. If modern day scorpions cause problems for us today, imagine these three foot versions running around stinging us. No Thank you. Moving on to number four now, we have the Smilodon. I absolutely love this one. I remember watching a show as a kid called Walking with Beasts that featured this very animal. Check it out if you haven't heard of it. The Smilodon lived from 2.5 million years ago to just 10,000 years ago. If you recognize the picture on the screen right now, you may know this creature by its much more famous name, the saber-toothed tiger. They were a force to be reckoned with. They had very well-built forelimbs and exceptionally big canine teeth. They spread out all over the world and came in a number of different types. The biggest ones were thought to have weighed up to 880 pounds. You might think, oh, well, I'm glad humans never had to live alongside these beasts. Well, think again, they did. Considering the saber-toothed tiger didn't die out until about 
about 100,000 years ago, there were already modern humans, just like me and you, walking around back then. Many of them got probably eaten by these big cats as they had nothing more than a simple spear to defend themselves. They died so that we could live. I vote that we don't bring them back. Next up at number three now, we have the Terror Bird. That's the nickname given to Forus Racidae, and I think the nickname suits it very well. They were the largest species of apex predators in South America for about 60 million years, starting 62 million years ago. That's a very, very long time. You can't even picture how long these things were the top dogs for. They were huge, standing up to 9.8 feet tall. They were flightless birds too. That's quite strange to think about. About. We usually think of flightless birds as quite harmless, dodos and penguins. Maybe ostriches could give you a good slash, but generally speaking, it's the flying hawks and things that are the scariest. This creature will make you think twice though. The terror birds were big. They weighed up to half a ton. Okay, so maybe that means you can outrun them. Oh no. Probably not. It's thought they could actually run as fast as a cheetah. That's about 75 miles an hour. If you see a terror bird and the terror bird sees you, just give up. Accept your fate as its lunch. Coming at number two now, we have the giant bird. That's my name for it. The real name for this creature is Pelagornis sandersi. It's one of the largest flying birds ever discovered. It lived 25 million years ago during the Oligocene era. This thing was huge. You may think you've seen a big bird in your time, maybe a pigeon or a seagull. Nah, you've not seen a big bird. Look at the size of this. It had a wingspan of up to 24 feet. Its wingspan was bigger than a giraffe is tall. Just try and imagine that. Perhaps fittingly, for one of the largest flying creatures to ever live. The only fossil of it was discovered in 1983 by construction workers at Charleston International Airport, South Carolina. And finally, number one now, we have Quetzalcoatlus. I'm not even sure how to start off with this one. Just look at this thing. This creature was a pterosaur. They lived alongside dinosaurs, but were very much their own thing. The Quetzalcoatlus was one of the largest flying animals of all time. It was toothless, it had a long stiff neck, and was just generally a bit of an oddball. Its wingspan was 52 feet. Remember the massive bird we were talking about just earlier? This creature had a wingspan twice that size. It's hard to even imagine how big this thing was. Ever since its discovery, people have been fascinated by it. It's been featured in documentaries and movies around the world. Perhaps the favorite one that I found is from Clash of the Dinosaurs. We already know that's wrong anyway, but wait till you hear this. The show portrayed them as having ultraviolet vision to locate dinosaur urine while hunting in the air. I'm obviously mocking this, but I do kind of want to watch it. Starting off at number 10 now, we have the Megalodon. Megalodon was the biggest shark that ever lived. They went extinct about 2.6 million years ago. Scientists think they could have grown to an insane 60 feet in length. That's about three times as long as the largest great white shark ever found. Here's how big they are. Before modern science identified them as a prehistoric species of shark, people used to think the Megalodon teeth they'd found were actually dragon tongues. Others said they belonged to giant serpents, or even that they were rocks that had fallen from the moon. Just think how big and scary you'd have to be for people to think that your teeth belong to dragons or outer space. It used to feed on prehistoric whales, and unlike modern sharks, which go for the soft underbelly of their prey, Megalodon just went for the whole thing. They would bite down on the whale's chest with some 41,000 pounds of force, the strongest ever recorded, and simply crush the whale's chest cavity and organs. They didn't stand a chance, and unless you're an even bigger whale watching this video, you probably wouldn't either. Next up at number nine now, we have Phobiromis patasoni. This was a huge rat. Some scientists have even called it Ratzilla. Technically, it wasn't a rat, but if you're scared of them, I bet you'd be scared of this. They reached a whopping 9.8 feet long. Their tails alone could reach 4.9 feet. They had the weight to go with it too, often reaching over 1,500 pounds. Like most rodents, they had big incisor teeth. In the case of Ratzilla though, their incisor teeth were about a foot long. It's a good job they were herbivores and used those teeth for plant life. However, I don't think that knowledge would do much to calm people if they were suddenly seen running around the streets at night. Coming at number eight now, we have the 
Titanoboa. Everyone with a phobia of snakes, please look away now. This was a massive snake, thought to actually be the largest that's ever lived. Its name literally means Titanic Boa. It lived around 60 million years ago. The largest individuals reached up to 42 feet in length and weighed over 2,500 pounds. That's well over a ton for a snake. It could grow this big because the Earth's climate was a lot warmer back then. As the climate began to cool over the next few million years, only smaller snakes could survive and snakes like the Titanoboa began to disappear. Probably a good thing for us humans because we would not want to be running around worrying about snakes that weigh as much as your average rhino. No thanks. Next up at number 7 now we have Dungliosteus. This is a fish that lived about 370 million years ago during the late Devonian period. These things were big, growing up to 30 feet in length and weighing over a ton. What's most scary about them is their bite. This fish could bite down on its prey with a force of some 6,000 newtons. That might not mean anything to you until I say that's almost about four times the bite strength of a polar bear. This fish could bite your arm clean off you, including the bone. Its jaws were so efficient they could hinge them open and snap them shut in a matter of milliseconds. If we were to bring this species back to life, people might worry about them more than sharks. At number six now, we have the Mega Piranha. Unlike a lot of scientific names on this list, the Mega Piranha has a kind of obvious one. It was a giant piranha fish that lived about 10 million years ago. They grew to around three feet long and unlike modern piranhas, they had not one but two separate rows of teeth. Scientists aren't even sure how hard they could bite, but some estimates go as high as 4,749 newtons. If that's the case, they would bite more than twice as hard as a hippo. Neither of those sounds fun, but one definitely sounds worse. Moving on to number five now, we have Gigantopithecus. In many ways, this creature is what we'd call Bigfoot. It lived between 9 million to 100,000 years ago in Asia and was the largest ape on Earth. They stood about 10 feet tall and their diets were mostly vegetarian. When I say stand, I mean stand in the way gorillas and chimpanzees do. It's thought they walked on all fours. However, a small number of scientists do think they walked on two legs like humans. Either way, with a 12 foot arm span, you'd be best to stay clear of this giant and unpredictable ape. Next up at number four now, we have Helicoprion. This was a shark-like creature that lived some 290 million years ago during the early Permian era. We've seen some very weird creatures on the list so far, but this might just beat them all. The Helicoprion is famous for his spirally arranged clusters of teeth known as tooth walls. This bizarre set of teeth would have reached about 24 inches in length. Moving on to number three now, we have the short-faced bear. The scientific name for these is the Arctodus. They first appeared in the fossil record 1.8 million years ago and seem to survive all the way up until just 11,000 years ago. So, a pretty close call for us modern humans. One specimen found weighed 2,000 110 pounds. They stood up to 12 feet tall on their hind legs, about twice the height of the average human male. Their vertical arm reach extended up to a further 14 feet. I could keep giving you guys stats on just how monstrous these bears were. Between those ones and the pictures you're seeing now, I think you get the idea. They were 50% larger than the biggest polar bears in recorded history. Scientists estimate they needed a whopping 35 pounds of meat a day just to survive. If we brought them back from extinction, I'm sure they wouldn't mind human meat being a part of that. Next up at number two now, we have the Meganeura. Dragonflies are nice, right? They're pretty cool looking creatures you find fluttering around ponds and rivers. They're a little bit freaky if they land on you, but you know, hey, at least they're small. Not Meganeura though. This massive dragonfly-like creature lived about 300 million years ago during a Carboniferous period. Its wingspan could reach up to 30 inches, making this thing about the size of a six-month-old baby. Don't ask me why I'm using a baby as a reference, it's just the best comparison I could find. They reach this size because insects need more oxygen the bigger they are. Back then, the oxygen levels in the atmosphere were higher than the current 20% we have today. This allowed insects, including Meganeura, to grow insanely big. You wouldn't need your hand to bat this thing away, more like a baseball bat. And finally at number one now, we have Dinosuchus. This is an extinct relation of the modern alligator that lived some 80 to 73 million years ago. That means it was alive at the same time as T. rex. In fact, it's thought these two actually fought it out back then. They are thought to have been up to 33 feet in length and have weighed as much as five tons. It looks like the T. rex might not have been much of a match for this oversized alligator. There have actually been T. rex fossils found with massive Dinosuchus bites found in them. Perhaps they were just defending their territories from T-Rexes, or perhaps they saw them as food. Either way, they definitely were not scared of T-Rexes, and so they definitely wouldn't be scared of 
us. I get the feeling if we brought them back from extinction, that might be where we're heading next. Number 10, the dodo. In the words of my roommate, dodo. Classic. Perhaps one of the most infamous extinctions known to man was that of the dodo bird. When humans met the dodo bird, they were literally eaten to death within 80 years, I think, of their discovery. They were easy to catch, and as their name suggests, they weren't they weren't the smartest. But guys, there are some really exciting things happening in the world of genetics and finally, scientists are on the way to bringing them back. After collecting various DNA samples in January 2016, the University of California announced they have completed the genome sequence of the dodo bird, opening a variety of doors. With this new information, scientists may be able to recover enough DNA to create a clone to implant in the eggs of the closely related modern pigeon. Number nine, the thylacine. The story of the last known thylacine or Tasmanian tiger is very sad. His name was Benjamin, and after thousands of his species were eradicated for fear that they'd eat Australia's cattle, he was the last one left. He was a resident in the Bomera Sioux in Hobart for a while, until one night, out of neglect, they didn't let him back into the kennel. He died of exposure, and his body was thrown into a dump. So sad. But Michael Archer believes we owe it to Benjamin to bring him back. There is one surviving sample of the thylacine that was pickled, pickled in alcohol. Unfortunately, some of the samples were contaminated by careless human DNA, so people reaching in going, ooh, look, it's so weird, and then dropping it back in. But the teeth contained viable samples. In fact, they were able to splice the thylacine cells successfully with a mouse. Archer even argues that should we be able to bring them back, that they could thrive in the Tasmanian ecosystem still as not much has changed. As we will discover on this list, there's a lot we can do now when it comes to cloning, so it is only a matter of time before we see them again. Number eight, aurochs. You you may have never heard of aurochs, but they are one of the most important creatures to have ever walked this earth. They are the great great grandparents of all living cattle today, so I guess you better thank them for the burger you're barbecuing. Aurochs used to roam all across Europe and were responsible for managing biodiversity through grazing. However, this species was hunted to extinction in 1627, but its DNA still lives on. The Tauros program aims to bring back the aurochs as a functional wild animal by backbreeding its closest relatives. It may not be exactly the same, but they hope to genetically breed this cattle to the point that it resembles as closely as possible the original aurochs, kind of like a modern day equivalent. Number seven, the ground sloth. Somebody warn Kristen Bell because I don't know if she will actually be able to handle this. The ground sloth was a massive version of the sloths we know now that existed around 8,000 years ago. Imagine a sloth combined with a giant bear. <laughs> So nice. They make the de-extinction list only because we do have DNA samples that have been extracted from a preserved strand of hair. So it could be done. The biggest problem preventing this, however, is the fact that no surviving relatives are large enough to give birth to it. But what scientists may be able to do is grow one in an artificial womb, which scientists in the Netherlands say they are within 10 years of perfecting. Number six, the Stellar Sea Cow. When I say sea cow, you might imagine the slow and lovable manatee, and you're not entirely wrong. They kind of look like a cross between a manatee and a sea lion. The Stellar Sea Cow is an extinct Cyrenian marine mammal, which is in the same order as the manatee. It used to live in the North Pacific Ocean during the Pleistocene and Holocene Epoch and was last discovered in 1741 by the Vitus Bering's Great Northern Expedition, but disappeared by the end of the 18th century. Scientists estimate that climate changes as well as Paleolithic human hunting may have been the reason the numbers were already so low even before Europeans made the last strike. Like some others on this list, however, scientists were able to sequence the genome, which could mean we may see these creatures again one day. Number five, elephant shrew. It may surprise you to know that though a lot of big awful things might have happened, some good did come out of 2020. The elephant shrew is just one tiny but apparently mighty example. For just over 50 years, not a single elephant shrew had been spotted, which led scientists to believe that sadly this little long-nosed mouse was a lost species. Since the 1970s, any information derived from the species was found through examinations of historic specimens. But in August 2020, a team of researchers and academics reported the opposite, that they were indeed alive and apparently well. Somehow, these little creatures were able to rebuild their numbers and are now thriving across the Horn of Africa once again. Number four, the woolly mammoth. Since the film Ice Age came out, I'm sure a lot of us can't picture the animal without imagining like Ray Romano's voice along with it because 
that's what we do. But eventually we may not have to use only our imaginations to see real life woolly mammoths. Mammoths preserved in the permafrost in Siberia have given paleogeneticists enough data that they have been able to sequence the woolly mammoth genome, which we already know is super important. With this data, they may be able to clone the creature or edit the genetic material to its closest living relative, the Asian elephant. But it gets even cooler than that. In 2019, scientists from Japan and Russia announced a significant step towards this goal. They were able able to bring cells of the woolly mammoth back to life. They were able to recover cells from the hind leg of a juvenile mammoth they found in Siberia that was uncovered in 2011. They successfully implanted 28,000 year old cell nuclei into mouse cells. So though we may be very far off from actually seeing a mammoth, the kind of technology that's being developed here is astounding. Like it's so cool. Scientists hope that they can use this technology to help prevent whole species from disappearing forever. Bringing back the woolly mammoth has a lot of scientific and ethical boundaries that need to be addressed. For instance, there's social creatures you'd need to bring back a whole herd. How would you introduce them back into the wild? Yada, yada, yada. But how cool is it that extinction in the future may rarely happen again if we can master this technology? Number three, the gastric brooding frog. The cooler name of this amphibian is the Rio Batracus, which were a kind of ground dwelling frog native to Queensland, Australia. It was one of two known frog species that was capable okay, of incubating their offspring within their stomach of the mother. She would swallow her own eggs, her stomach would stop making hydrochloric acid to avoid digestion and transform her stomach into a womb essentially. When the anywhere from 20 to 25 tadpoles hatched, the mucus from their gills kept the acid at bay, which was super exciting for scientists because then they could figure out how to do that in humans if they were able to study them. But unfortunately, these frogs disappeared almost as soon as they were discovered. Unfortunately, both species of this weird and wonderful genus became extinct around the mid 1980s, but, but the scientists, a part of the appropriately named Lazarus Project, planned to bring it back to life. Previous cell samples of the species collected prior to the 1970s have been preserved for 40 years in a conventional freezer. In 2013, Professor Mike Archer and his colleagues announced they were able to successfully grow early stage cloned embryos containing DNA from the gastric brooding frog. Though it's taking longer than a couple years, the Lazarus Project is still on track to bring this unique creature back to life. But it's also important to know that frogs across the world are dying from the deadly chytrid fungus, and this technology could save them all. Number two, the quagga. So they actually have brought this back, kind of. The quagga was a type of zebra that used to roam South Africa in herds before European settlers killed them all. But now scientists in Cape Town figured out how to bring them back. Quaggas had stripes very similar to zebras, but they only appeared on the front half of their bodies and are brown along the rear. Eric Harley, the project's leader, discovered that the key to bringing back this animal was through genetics, of course, as we, we know now. By testing quagga skins, they discovered that they were actually a subspecies of the zebras we know and love. Therefore, it could be possible to manifest the genes through selective breeding and they were right. They are now in the fifth generation of the breeding process and already there are less and less stripes and the appearance of a brown color. The next step would be to see if they can exact the pattern and behavioral differences between the quagga and zebras, not just the coloring. So they still got a long way to go, but really cool. Number one, the Pyrian ebex. So technically, this is the only species to ever go extinct twice. The Pyrian ebex or Bicardo became extinct back in 2000 when a fallen tree fell on the last female Celia. Sad way to go. But scientists were quick to freeze some of the cells in liquid nitrogen. With these cells, they were able to clone a calf in 2003 that was brought to life for only a few minutes before it died. Despite the loss, it was a historic event in history and the first de-extinction. Now they still plan to use the 14 year old cells of Celia, but first they must see if they are still alive. In addition to this, they are also attempting to clone embryos and implant them in female goats. So they did it once. Who is to say they won't be able to do it again, but maybe, maybe with bigger prey. Now, some of the questions that accompany and often oppose the extinction is if we do bring them back, where will we put them? Will they thrive in today's ecosystems or die out again? Should we keep them in a lab? That's no way to live. If we put them in a theme park, well, we all know how that went with Jurassic Park. 